I'm delighted to be joined by Isabella Salasufi, who is actually a student at Ada College, which is the National College for Digital Skills. And also we're lucky to be joined by Millie Zanetta, who is the Head of Public Policy at the Open Data Institute. Ladies, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's great that we could organise this today. I'm very excited to know what questions you have for Millie, Isabella. So would you like to kick off with the first question? Sure. So I wanted to ask, um, what ethical issues would you say there are regarding data and how would you minimise them? Thanks. That's um, a really great, great question um, and a really important one. Ethics as a topic is, is huge. I actually studied philosophy first, so ethics is a major topic. It's one of the first kind of, you know, things that people started worrying about, even before you get to the way that um, data has emerged as a particular branch of ethics. Um, so with data ethics, again, it's, it's all the ethics you'd have in other areas, but apply to data and then some specific questions around data itself. Um, so, for example, um, around the um, near the start of the pandemic, we did a project um, where we were looking at um, data about children's welfare in the pandemic, you know, thinking about the effect of lockdowns on them. And we knew that um, the data that we had was not complete, which meant that the analysis that we were going to do on it might not be accurate. Um, but the question we had to ask ourselves was, um, what are the consequences of not doing this work, given that it was also urgent and fast moving? So you could, you know, wait until you've got it perfect and then be really confident about your answer that you're doing the right thing. Or you could maybe take a risk and do something imperfect, knowing that it wasn't quite right, you know. Um, and I think that's a, a new kind of um, challenge that we have around, around data ethics. Um, because the field is moving so quickly and the consequences can be quite significant. And I feel that's a bit different maybe from, I don't know, maybe when I was doing, um, say, bioethics, where maybe you have more time to make decisions. Um, I'm not sure that might be that might be wrong. And maybe someone who knows more about bioethics might, might disagree with me. So when you deal with like ethical issues, do you think that like there's a general way to go about it? Or does each company go specific to like their values and how they want, like how they think it will? affect people? I think that's exactly it. Yeah. I think that different organisations approach it differently and um, you know you get sort of a code of ethics for um, a sector for a part of the economy or industry. Um, some companies have their own code of ethics um, and so on and sometimes they overlap but but maybe not on all things or maybe um, maybe they've got like a high level principle like you know think about the consequences, think about harm but maybe it doesn't tell you the practical way to interpret it day to day. It's not yet resolved, you know, um, and I feel like even if we found a way to write a single code of ethics that was true for every sector and every use case, then you'd probably end up with a big rule book. <laughs> you know? So again, that, that could also be make it difficult to apply it and for it to feel useful and, and relevant. Um, so one thing that we do at the Open Data Institute is we've got um, a tool called the Data Ethics Canvas, and it's kind of like a grid and it, it's just the kinds of questions you should be asking. So rather than providing rules and guidelines, it just helps you think about what questions to ask. Um, and it's meant to be a group activity. So um, I think by going through the questions together, it allows you to find things you hadn't thought of or to find what's important to other people. Um, and I think that's maybe a good way of doing ethics. It's, you know, with others, listening to each other, being open to finding out, you know, points of view that you hadn't considered, that sort of thing. So um, similar to ethical issues, would you, uh, I read that there's um, a gender and cultural bias in things like code. And would you say that there's a gender or cultural bias in data? And if so, how is it dealt with? Um, thanks, Isabella. So that's a really great question. It's an important topic. Um, but I also liked um, how you put the question, um, bringing out both possible gender bias, but also cultural bias. So I'll, I'll say a bit about gender bias. Um, so, you know, when we, um, when we collect data to be analysed, um, maybe with a, a computer code and algorithm. Um, if, if the data has gaps in it, then that's going to affect the quality of the algorithm and the analysis that it does. Um, and the data can have gaps in it, maybe because the people collecting the data didn't think a community was important or you know, didn't, didn't consider them when they were planning, planning their, their work. Um, and so sometimes you, you know, gender bias can happen that way. Maybe there's just not data about women for some kind of studies and research and so on. Um, and, and that can affect other communities too. Um, but cultural bias is interesting because um, maybe that happens more at the level of how we organise data. So I'll, I'll give an example maybe from um, museums. So if you go to, say, um, a European museum, 
It might have objects in it from around the world, um, maybe from a colonial period. Um, and in the European country, may organise those objects in a certain way in different categories. I don't know, like maybe furniture or, you know, um, I don't know, a travel and, and so on. Um, but maybe those weren't the categories that would have been used by the people from those other countries would have a different mental framework in different categories. Um, and so there, the way that objects are being organised has a certain cultural perspective. And so you can apply that to data in the same way that maybe the categories that we're using for organising data um, have a cultural bias, um, which means that other communities, um, other cultures might see data in very, very different ways. Um, and um, earlier you asked me a question about ethics. Um, so, for example, um, European ethics tends to be quite individualistic because it's about freedom and autonomy and identity. But um, African ethics tends to be about community and kind of um, harmony. And so um, an African approach to data ethics would be about the collective good, maybe, rather than individual privacy. So that, that's very interesting to me and quite exciting to think about the new approaches we might have. That's really interesting. Um, I wanted to ask, um, how has your experience been as a woman in STEM and what message or advice would you have for young people out there? That's, that's another good question. Um, so as a woman in, in STEM, I'm, I must confess, I actually, um, I actually studied the arts. <laughs> so I, I studied philosophy um, and then um, I, I, I did my PhD in philosophy of art. So actually for me, working in STEM was a bit intimidating because um, the last time I did sciences properly was at my A-levels, A-level biology and maths, and that was it, you know, like 10 years ago maybe longer. <laughs> so it was um, it, it was a bit intimidating coming in, thinking, oh, you know, this maybe this is going to be masculine or too difficult for me. Um, but I, I found it, yeah, really, I think once you find something that you enjoy and you just, um, you can apply yourself to it, those things sort of disappear. Um, and for me, what I liked about data, it's a lot like philosophy, it's about problem solving, um, and it's about thinking of the world in different ways. So it didn't feel different to when I was thinking about art or other things. Um, so it's really important to find something that you enjoy and then I think um, be open-minded about, about what that might look like as you know you find new aspects of that subject and so on. I mean I can I can tell you a, a slightly funny story about how I got into working in data and AI. So I used to teach philosophy and then um, I decided to try to, um, uh, um, it was a part-time job so I decided that I, I wanted to get a full-time job and that would probably mean working in an office. Um, and I heard that with those kinds of jobs, you should go on um, social media on LinkedIn and put your CV up there, you know, um, to show that you're ready for office life. So I did that. I created a LinkedIn profile and filled it in. Um, and as soon as I completed it, um, the algorithm started recommending jobs at Google. So this was about seven years ago. I didn't have a laptop. I'd never used a laptop. I didn't have a smartphone. I'd never used a smartphone. No tablet. My computer had a floppy disk drive. <laughs> you know, it was pretty old school. I was the last person you'd expect to be working at Google. Um, but the algorithm on LinkedIn just analysed my CV and saw that I had these sort of, you know, um, I'm quite good at thinking in an analytic way from, from doing philosophy. Um, and so it started recommending jobs in technology. So I, I found that a really positive experience. That's amazing. And it seems like there are so many different worlds that you could potentially go into as a graduate of ADA. Does it appeal having that sort of that crossover between the arts and technology in your career and your work life? What do you think? I think so, yeah. Like um, at ADA, I've done like different units. For example, I've done like social, like business applications or social media and cybersecurity and games development. They've all taught me different things and shown me aspects of computing technology that I could go into. And for example, doing game development has allowed me to show my creative side. So I really enjoy art and drawing, but I'm not the best at art. Like I did GCSE art and photography, but I wasn't the best at it. And I didn't, I wasn't good at drawing. And I feel like doing games development units at college has allowed me to like combine my creative side with technology. And so be able to express myself in a way that I find easier. Yeah, it's like, Contrary to popular opinion, perhaps, you can actually use different facets of your personality within tech. I'm just wondering about the larger theme of the world that we live in at the moment in the pandemic. 
and um, what learnings you think there have been for professionals and tech Millie from the pandemic and getting data out very fast so that professionals can use it to apply to their different settings. Um, thanks, Tamsin. Yeah, it's um, the pandemic has definitely changed how we use data and technology. It speeded everything up and also scaled it up and made it much faster. Um, but I was just thinking, Isabel, about what you said about creativity. And I, I think that it's, um, I think creativity is going to be more and more important as tech develops. Um, because, you know, technology can't think, but it's the people that do the thinking behind the technology. And so we need creative problem solvers um, and we need to, um, technology by itself can't express anything. It can only express what humans give us. So it, we have to be the ones expressing ourselves through it, you know. And I think that's going to become more and more important as the technology kind of reaches the level of like lots of different people be, being able to work with it and use it. It's going to be more important to be creative with it. Um, but again, yeah, so thinking about the pandemic, um, I think we it was a, a situation that no one knew how to address. And so we had to be creative in our problem solving and try new things. And we had to be willing to learn from mistakes um, in real time. So I think that we learned to work quickly. We learned to learn quickly. And we learned to, um, I think, yeah, just to, to try things. I guess we're constantly experimenting in tech and in life. And I think that's probably a very strong note to end on. Do you have any further questions, Isabella? Or... Uh, no, I don't. I've really appreciated all the information that you've told me and I've enjoyed learning about it. I've looked at like data briefly in my units, looking at like big data and how it can be used in AR and VR, but it's a lot really interesting to learn about like the ethics of it and the biases in it as well. Oh, no, thanks. I, I really enjoyed our conversation, this interview, Isabella. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you for joining us at Tekarati. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.